Well, good day to you once again. Uh, my name is Pastor Dave McKenzie. You've landed at Bay Community Church, either here in the moment or on social media. Welcome to you all. Welcome to everyone who is uh, with us today. Um, we don't necessarily have a traditional reading for Epiphany this morning, but a couple readings, one from the Old Testament book of Chronicles, the second book of Chronicles, and one from the Gospel of Mark. So I'm going to start actually with um, a reference to uh, King Jehoshaphat's reforms in actually Second Chronicles 19, verses 4 through 11. Uh, Jehoshaphat was a good king. He had the odd problem. Uh, occasionally he was uh, unequally yoked with people who probably didn't believe at all, and God knew it, and occasionally sort of reminded Jehoshaphat of that through the prophets. But Jehoshaphat fundamentally was a man who sought God. And in these particular situations, during the time of his reign, he actually had a few things to reform. And so this is one of them. Uh, this is one of a series of things that we'll read about here. Jehoshaphat was the, the, the king in Judah, and so it begins this way. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and once again he went out among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and turned them back, the people of Ephraim, turned them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He appointed judges in the land in each of the fortified cities of Judah. Then he said to the judges, consider carefully what you do, for you are not judging for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. And now may the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Moreover, Jehoshaphat appointed in Jerusalem some of the Levites, priests and heads of the Israelite families to judge on behalf of the Lord and to settle disputes. And they lived in Jerusalem. He commanded them saying, you must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. For every dispute that comes before you from your brothers who dwell in their cities, whether it regards bloodshed or some other violation of law, commandments, statutes or ordinances, you are to warn them so that they will not incur guilt before the Lord and wrath will not come upon you and your brothers. Do this and you will not incur guilt. Note that Amariah, the chief priest, will be over you in all that pertains to the Lord. And Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, in all that pertains to the king. And the Levites will serve as officers before you. Act resolutely. And may the Lord be with the upright. And a reading now from actually the gospel according to Mark, the second chapter, verses uh, 1 through 12 in this instance. Early in Jesus' ministry in this case. A few days later, Jesus went back to Capernaum. And when the people heard that he was home, they gathered in such large numbers that there was no more room, not even outside the door, as Jesus spoke the word to them. Then a paralytic was brought to him, carried by four men. Since they were unable to get to Jesus through the crowd, they uncovered the roof above him, made an opening, and lowered the paralytic on his mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking in their hearts, Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And once Jesus knew in his spirit that they were thinking this way within themselves, why are you thinking these things in your hearts, he asked. Which is easier to say to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up. Pick up your mat and go home. And immediately the man got up, picked up his mat, and walked out in front of them all. As a result, 
they were all astounded and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and we give you thanks, O Lord, for your word today. And we ask your blessing upon it. We pray that your Holy Spirit might be involved in anyone who is actually hearing these words today and guiding them into all truth. And we pray that these words of interpretation too might be upheld by you, might be ref properly reflective of the word of God. And may, Lord, your people be encouraged and blessed and built up in the word and in the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, Happy New Year to you all. Glad you could be here. Maybe you're glad spring's coming. <laughs> I don't know, but in any case, we still got January to work our way through, it is true. But uh, I want to open up today, not so much directly in the passages we just read, although I'll, I'll work those in later, but I want to actually draw your attention now to, uh, like back to the book of Exodus in some way. It's probably a famous image that you will know anyway, hence I didn't include it in the formal readings today. But when, when Moses came down the holy mountain with the Ten Commandments in his hands, it is written in Exodus that he was, of course, horrified by what he saw when he got back to the camp, for the camp had fallen into chaos, disarray, and disorderliness and immorality in his absence for 40 days or so. The people were running wild, as it's sometimes described in the scriptures themselves. And Moses, upon seeing the revelry, upon seeing the debauchery, upon seeing the idolatry of the people of Israel in his absence, asked a simple question to the crowd when he came to the entrance of the encampment. And that question was this, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And that's, uh, that's how it's translated in the King James. As the book of Exodus therefore recounts, the ones who most swiftly answered Moses' question were interestingly the sons of Levi, the Levites as we came to know them. And so it was that they, by their response and their subsequent execution of God's judgment upon the people, upon their faithlessness, were actually confirmed in their ordination to serve God first because they chose God first. They weren't content to be, you know, as Jesus might call it, the members of the harvest. They, they wanted to be a harvest worker. They were those who were on the Lord's side, who wanted to serve as ministers to the God of Israel. And so it was that they... Uh, forsook, you might, could say, the, the familial and the tribal loyalties that define a lot of cultures, even to this day. And they chose the Lord over and above them. And like I say, this is why their names to this day are associated with the temple in Jerusalem. You think not only of the high priests and their lines, but you think of the Levites. But I don't believe that the question of who is on the Lord's side has ever become antiquated or passe. It's every bit as much a contemporary question. The question of our allegiance goes hand in hand with the question of the Lord's authority and who he is. And early in the Gospel of Mark, as we read today, early in Jesus' public ministry, there is a fascinating testimony to the issue of Christ's authority. In Mark's first chapter, one gets a hint of what's coming. As the people are amazed that Jesus of Nazareth can order demons to come out of people or tell them to shut up, which is really how 
he probably did say it. You know, we could say be silent, and it sounds a little bit more formal, but it probably was more like shut up. <laughs> when they were mouthing off about his true identity, and he didn't want the demons of hell to be his advertising. And so he told them to shut up. And the crowds actually were astonished that he could order them around like this. They perceived in him something that was unusual, something that was authoritative. And so it is that in the first chapter of Mark, we get this line that the people were amazed and said, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. Because they saw that it just wasn't baffle gab or philosophical musing or sophistry, as we might say. It wasn't just sort of, you know, speaking for the sake of speaking. This teaching came with real palpable authority. And in the second chapter of Mark, that trend continues. There is, as we know, a paralytic. Four men carry him to the roof of the home where Jesus is preaching. To Jesus' home, from what we understand from Mark, he had a, an actual abode in Capernaum when he was an adult. In faith, these four came, trusting that Jesus would help their friend that they carried. And Jesus, upon seeing their faith, of the stretcher bearers, you might say, turned to the man on the stretcher and said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus says, we still believe, saves by grace through faith. Hopefully we still say amen to that. Jesus still saves by grace through faith. But the real gripping edge of the passage is what, in, is what happens after Jesus pronounces forgiveness for the paralytic. There were temple scribes in the crowd kicking around at that time, surrounding the house. And in his spirit... Jesus sensed that they were troubled by this, by what he just said. Why? Well, as they said, no one can forgive sins but God alone. And understand this, in principle, the scribes aren't wrong. They aren't wrong. Yes, now, now we need to back up a little bit and to, to define the kind of forgiveness we are talking about here. Uh, yes, victims of a problem or a crime or what have you, an injustice, can forgive perpetrators for the injustice that was committed upon them. They have that authority, that is true. But the sins of the perpetrators don't just eventually evaporate or expire over time thereby. Those sins stand before God. And they separate us from God. Hence, uh, David is quite right in the 51st Psalm when he says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, O God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be proved right when you speak and blameless when you judge. You see, David knew fundamentally that there are sins perpetrated upon other people for sure, but fundamentally those sins stand before God as an impediment. So David simply says, I know that it's before you that my sins are. Sin is an outstanding debt, therefore, with God, and that debt just continues to accrue over time, you might even say, if you want to use that metaphor. Hence, to pronounce that a man's sin are, sins are forgiven in an objective sense is different from just saying, I forgive you for the fact you cut me off in traffic, or something more banal, or troubling. And Jesus wasn't complaining, so we need to make this clear, he wasn't complaining about the hole in his roof. That wasn't the wrong that he's referring to. So if Jesus isn't 
the divine Son of God, isn't the second person of the Holy Trinity, then Jesus is blaspheming. And this is not a small issue. It cuts to the core of his identity and his ministry. And Jesus actually settles the issue of his authority. If you, the listener, can believe it, because Jesus is quite rightly pragmatic to point out this simple truth. He says out loud, which is easier to say to a paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? Or more specifically, get up, pick up your mat and walk? Hence, this moment in Capernaum is going to draw the faith out of you. Or not, as the case may be. But it's certainly intended to do so. This moment in Capernaum is intended to draw faith out of you. To make you answer the question, what is it that you conclude about this moment? Who is this guy? Jesus even presses the point home. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. So that you may know. In a way, it's kind of as blunt as Moses saying, who's on the Lord's side here? Who's on the Lord's side? And the crowd was, as you can well imagine, Stunned when immediately following Jesus' words, the man got up, picked up his mat, and walked out in front of them all. He, he actually literally followed the command of Jesus. He didn't even stop to say, thank you, I want to thank everybody who tore the hole in the roof. He didn't stop for speech. He just simply walked out, took his mat with him, and headed home. Can't fault his obedience, that's for sure. So the crowd was stunned, and who wouldn't be? Because in essence, from the faith drawn out of certainly some who were present, if not all, they had just heard the voice of God. In that humble house in Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, they were in the presence of divine authority, and they knew it. And the crowd itself would testify, we have never seen anything like this. Well, And this, my friends, is the essence of the new season of Epiphany, right? We are no longer at Christmas tide. We are in the season of Epiphany, that Christ Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, that he is God in man made manifest. And so the word epiphany and its close relationship to the word manifest is used in Greek, and we've inherited it from the Greek in the English language. This is the season where Christ was made manifest, where Magi came to point out the king of the Jews, and that stirred them all up. Jesus proved that he, that he is God and man made manifest that day in Capernaum for anyone and everyone who would simply like to connect the dots. Now, it is true that you don't have to connect the dots. Nobody has to connect the dots. But if you bother to connect the dots, then confession is the only thing that comes next. Because once again, Jesus intended that connection to be made, for indeed he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Jesus is not a man to blow his own trumpet, don't get me wrong. He's not there to, to wow the crowds. He could simply wow them consistently and perpetually for eternity if he wanted to. But he certainly allowed the crowd that day to connect the dog. That's what I love about the confession of faith. It truly is a confession because it really has to come from us, doesn't it? Jesus doesn't need to tell us who he is. He just needs to show us and we need to confess it, right? 
So the onus is actually on us. The response is ours. The question is, will we respond in faith or will we not? Will we refuse to connect those dots? But if you connect the dots, you know fundamentally that Jesus has divine authority on earth, both as son of man and son of God. He is both concurrently. And this is why today, like to drive this passage into the present, I think is always in some ways on my mind when I do a sermon, to, to take what we, are lear- we have learned biblically and to draw it into the presence. I want to make a few conclusions. Now, you, you can actually look at this in a, in a whole number of ways, but I'm going to look at it this way because I think in some sense the question of authority is front and center, even still. And it just manifests, or the challenges to it manifest differently. I want to reflect upon some disturbing news that came throughout the latter half of 2023. And, you know, since we're on the threshold and have passed through the threshold of a new year, to take a look at this as it pertains to that authority that we have seen in Scripture today. It might seem a little unusual to go in this direction, but I would beg your indulgence at this point. On, on September 14th of 2023, which was re- and, and, and reported on the website of China Aid, by the way, this is from China Aid, news broke in China of a priest who had been convicted in a Chinese court of law. Specifically, he was convicted of fraud. Okay, and I want you to remember that is the charge. But for the purposes of this sermon, I want the congregation to know that I have placed quotation marks around this word fraud. For fraud is now a blasphemous weapon used in Chinese courts of law. It's blasphemy. This is what I mean. I can say this because the actual charge laid against this Catholic priest was that of impersonating religious personnel. Okay, get that? Impersonating religious personnel. That was apparently his fraudulent behavior. And just why was this priest charged with so-called fraud? Well, it was because he refused to join the patriotic three-self church, as it is called in China, that the Communist Party controls. The equivalent would be uh, people who refused to join the Nazified Lutheran Church in Germany or the Nazified Catholic Church or other church in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s, but instead joined the confessing church. What did they confess? That Jesus is Lord, not the Fuhrer, right? So that would be the equivalent in this case, historically, to this. China wants to subvert the actual Christian church, and so it has created the three-self patriotic church, which is nothing more than a front for communist propaganda. And this priest refused to join that because he still believed that Jesus is Lord. And so they brought him up on charges of fraud and impersonating religious personnel because the only religious personnel that can be publicly allowed in China are ones that actually affirm that communism is everything and the gospel means very little. Do you you get that? This is why I call it blasphemy. This is why I call that move blasphemy. Because who is it that calls people to Christian ministry? Is it the state that calls? Or is it someone higher? Someone with authority? The authority to say to a man, get up and walk. The rightful king of all kings and lord of all lords. It's shocking and stunning. 
This, like I say, this priest wanted to maintain independence from the state structure. You might just argue that the priest wanted to affirm Jehoshaphat's reforms. Why do I say that? Well, if you'll notice, this, this area is actually quite interesting in the Bible, this the Second Chronicles 19, because in addition to Jesus' words of, you know, uh, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and, and to God what is God's, in addition to that well-known statement of Jesus's, is this account from Jehoshaphat, where he specifically points out the fact that actually there should be such a thing as the temple's business and separately the state's business. So you could argue that the separation of church and state or religious group and state, you know, has some value because even Jehoshaphat saw that it was so and Jesus even affirmed it on some level. Because what happens sometimes is the state attempts to subvert the people of God. It's routine through history. But I think more to the point, and you can say this kind of in a very sort of bald way, I guess, that this Chinese priest decided by himself, by the grace of God, that Jesus, not Xi Jinping, is Lord of the church. So he may be in prison for fraud, but he is a hero in faith. He is a martyr. He hasn't died yet, but he could. He was charged by China's governmental prosecutors with impersonating a church leader when in fact he was a church leader. If you want to talk about fraud, it's the fraud of the state redefining what a true calling is. That's the fraud. And then, so it seems that to the government of China as it presently stands, it is not possible for God to call people to Christian ministry, only the state, and that is a shockeroo. It should be a shock. It's untrue, actually. It is untrue. That's why I would argue that their definition of fraud is actually itself fraudulent. As far as I'm concerned, this action of theirs is state-sponsored blasphemy. Full stop. As someone who never wanted to be a pastor, because my father was a pastor, but who was called by God to ministry in a dream from the Lord in April of 1985. It is absolutely scandalous that China or any other state government should tread on the holy ground of divine calling with its totalitarian jackboots. Absolutely scandalous. Ask yourself this, do you actually believe that God doesn't ordain anyone anymore? Do you really believe that? I don't believe it, I can't believe it. He calls, still. I don't believe it's just the state which possesses the right to appoint Christian leaders. And if you do, I, I'd be interested in knowing just how you back that up biblically, because I've been looking really hard for this one, and I can't find it. But you know what? Ironically, it's not just China's policies that are a problem here. It's, it's almost a growing, I think, generational problem. And we spoke earlier in prayer about the fact that, you know, there, the unseen is significant in these situations. There are unseen spiritual things driving this kind of generational response in a way. I mean, how else can we come to the conclusion uh, of what we're seeing, I suppose? It, it's not all flesh and blood, it isn't. It's not just party policies. It's unseen things, it must be. It's too ubiquitous. The very same week in September, that this court ruled its appalling ruling in China. There was a law professor in Norway, and he went public 
with his theory in this case that over 50 years of Methodist marriages in the country could be invalid because the state had not approved the Methodist Church of Norway's formal wedding liturgies. Okay, do you, do you hear that? Do you hear that? If you were a Methodist who got married between 1970 and 2023, uh, between areas where the liturgies had been officially stamped with approval by the government of Norway, it means that your marriage was no longer legit. At least that was the, in the, that was the claim by this law professor in Norway. Now, thankfully, that claim quickly was challenged. But it was symbolic to me. Symbolic of the same generational problem. Are you kidding me? Is it the state who calls people to marriage? <laughs> yeah, that's a decent question to ask, isn't it? If memory serves, it used to be called holy matrimony for a reason. And here is the reason. From the beginning of creation, Jesus said, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder or separate. It is quite obvious, therefore, from Christ's own words that it is not simply the will of the flesh that draws people together in holy matrimony. It is the calling of God that is at stake here. I sometimes think we aren't very sensitive to that. There are probably people pursuing marriage through the lens of their hormones alone when they ought to be asking the Lord. But honestly, for a law professor, to actually believe that really your marriage is invalid because the church didn't quite live up to the state? Are you joking? Who says you can breach the authority of the church? If the church is called to recognize the divine callings of individuals and their divine gifts, then what gives the state the right to redefine marriage? Especially holy marriage done in a church. I mean, you want your civic marriages, your civil marriages? Okay, that's fine. It's available to anyone. And you know, there are countries that do different things with that. In France, you, you, you go to the, the civil uh, court of justice and get your documentation. And then if you want, you go to the church, right? But the church doesn't define what holy matrimony, or, the, or rather the state doesn't define whose marriage is actually legit or illegitimate. You know, one has to hand it, I think, to the gospel writer of Mark. He made certain that Jesus' remarks as regards divine authority were made public. He wanted that to be a, a, a priority. I think authority in the gospel of Mark is front and center, certainly in the first two chapters, but even later. And like I say, it's not the state that joins anyone in holy matrimony. It's just the authority of God. Clearly in the minds of some modern people, there is no such thing as supernatural authority anymore, but just state authority. And, and isn't that how, isn't that where we come to when, when, when our faith just simply, you know, fizzles away publicly into very little? Is that we actually believe that the only authority really is the authority of the collective or the state? Is that true? Is that true? I don't think it is. But, you know, it gets even worse. You know, in mid-November, this is just, you know, two months later, there was a testimony from a female survivor of the North Korean regime that all pregnancies in that country have to be authorized. Now, I mean, you're, you're familiar with, with China's policy of, you know, past one kid for a while, and then they, they actually saw that their country was depopulating, so now they've changed that, and you can have more kids. But, but in reality, they tried to structure, the state tried to structure that type of thing. But in North Korea, it's different. You have to be authorized by the state to get pregnant. 
That must create quite a bureaucratic bundle, right? Given the hormones of people, really? Oh, I'm sorry, you weren't authorized. Of course, it's not above North Korea to, to, to you know, put state abortion in, in the midst of that and force people, compel people to do state-run abortion too, because that's the kind of stages that ex exists in a totalitarian regime. But you know, so much for the Far East. How about this? This fall, a court in the state of Washington ruled that the state government could force Christian missionaries of the Yakima Street Mission to hire outside of Christianity, all in the name of diversity, of course. Now, I, I'm asking you again here, do you think the state has the authority to tell you that you must hire someone who doesn't believe in the mission of Jesus Christ? Do you think that's even remotely normal? I think part of the, part of the shock that we have as Christians is, you know, in, in our minority position in, in culture, we actually still expect on some level certain wisdom to be operative within actually uh, the culture. And what we find instead is there is this remarkable growth in state power and contempt for divine wisdom, traditional morality, things like that. And as a net result, we end up in this place where we are subject to the diktats of people who are crossing boundaries they never should cross. Why are bureaucrats crossing boundaries that belong to the church and the church alone? I can't imagine somebody saying, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Trudeau, you, you must hire pro-lifers in your liberal party ranks, even though you disagree with that, because, well, you know, it's, it's diverse. I can't imagine that type of transgression happening without a whole lot of complaint from party policy experts and people who want to guard the ideology that defines them. Well, why should a faith not want to guard the corpus of biblical belief that we have inherited, which means that, you know what, it's God that calls individuals and it's the church who identifies that calling. And we don't need people telling us who to hire. We know it spiritually. There are certain things that a spiritual man and woman, directed by the Holy Spirit, know better, better than the state. Amen. Like I say, there's a representation, a kind of love for statism these days. That if it could, if it could, it would drive all biblical belief underground while compelling public church boards to accept only those pastors, I put that in quotation marks, to which the state gave its official approval. Is that not a scary future? I think the authentic church would reject that. And if it were forced to it, it would simply go underground. You can have your public, above-ground, symbolic pieces of nonsense. The authentic church will now be hidden. It will go crypto, out of necessity. These are, I think, regardless, the days of the super state. Apparently, Washington state even wants to become more like China, as we see, albeit for maybe slightly different reasons. But nevertheless, these are the days of the super state of, I would say, arrogance, of hubris, and presumption at the level of governance that would simply deny God's authority, deny God's calling, deny God's biology, and control everything and everyone if it could. This is the world we appear to be walking directly into in 2024. And while Christians are certainly called to obey governance in general terms, and yet I, and you just have to look up Romans 13, 13.1, if you want to take a look at that. It bears noting that Christians have no obligation, zero obligation, to obey governance whenever governance usurps divine authority or sullies the holy ground of God's ordination and calling. The church is not called to obey in those situations. At that point, it's called to obey God in those situations. Simply put, the state has no right to regulate pregnancies and the gift of life. The state has no right to invalidate holy matrimony and no right to gainsay the calling and the ordination of a priest or pastor. And it certainly has no right to tell the church who it can and cannot hire. 
Any state that attempts this invites not only the righteous anger of believers, but it invites the wrath of God. And I won't actually just state that. The state cannot go to that well again and again and again without inviting the wrath of God because you're transgressing his boundaries, not simply the church's. His ordination, not simply the church's identification of an ordination or recognition. And yet I solemnly believe that in 2024 and going forward, this I think will be the test that God allows his church to experience. This is the test, folks. It will ask the question of you and of me, who is on the Lord's side? The good news is to those who gathered around that house in Capernaum, that there was only one authority that encouraged or even astounded them. It was divine authority, authority that forgave sins, authority that gave hope, authority that gave newfound freedom by making paralytics walk again. These people were quite familiar, let's, let's be honest about this, the, the people of that day were quite familiar with the impertinence of Rome, right? They knew exactly what kind of boundaries Rome would transgress. But that wasn't what shocked them. What shocked them instead, what astounded them that day was Jesus. It was God's authority that has suddenly become obvious. It has suddenly become manifest in a little house by the Galilean Sea. And this is why they said in joyful shock, we have never seen anything like this. <clears throat> well, have you seen it? Do you see it? Do you believe it? And if so, to those who do, I can simply say this, happy epiphany. For you have had an epiphany. You have actually seen the revelation of God and have said, that man, that man packs divine authority. That man is the one I need to listen to. That is the one who has come to save. And you know, recognizing the divine epiphany is important because it not, it's not like it comes with the world's fanfare. It doesn't. It comes with a few signs that magi see from afar and everyone else doesn't even notice. It comes in strange circumstances, sometimes just by a house and on the shore of a lake where a man who was paralyzed for years suddenly walks again. That's the guy I want. I can't speak for you, but that's the guy I want. And I believe that this epiphany season is about recognizing, even in the mystery and in the subtlety, the one who came to save, the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who himself will humble and will discipline you, me, and even the state where it becomes too big for its britches. Thank God there is a discipliner that sits high above the realm of earth. And that, I would suggest, is our advantage. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. That you came in Christ Jesus and you came with authority and that authority didn't come necessarily with Hollywood with bells and with flashing lights saying, look at me, look at me. It came instead subtly, but it came nonetheless. And Father, I thank you that Jesus has been revealed to us. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you that we owe to him our final and ultimate allegiance. And we pray, O oh Lord, too, as the church, that you would discipline the nations. Discipline and disciple the nations, that they may learn this truth, that they might not usurp the divine role in governance. 
and that they, O oh Lord, would respect those who respect God first. I pray for this miracle. But Lord, even if in 2024 we face more of the same, I pray that you would stiffen our resolve here in the church at bay and everywhere where the authentic church gathers, that you would stiffen our resolve to be those who give honor to you first, who answer the call when the question is given, who is on the Lord's side? And I pray this in Jesus' name.